All right. Um, I'll do a brief introduction. Uh, so we're here today with uh, Dr. Megan Palmer. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself and give uh, like a brief introduction, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, Megan Palmer, I am now Executive Director of Biopolicy and Leadership Initiatives in the Department of Bioengineering at Stanford. Um, and until recently, I was a senior research scholar over in the Center for International Security and Cooperation, also at Stanford. Um, and I'm a bioengineer by background, but look at a lot of the policy, organizational, um, and governance issues around biotechnology and uh, especially synthetic biology. And um, part of that has been looking at issues around safety and security. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much for speaking with us today, by the way. We're really excited to your presentation. Awesome. It's great to be with you and uh, fun to do these, uh, the speaker series. Should I take it away? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sounds great. So as far as I um, understood um, from Emily and others is that you're hoping for maybe uh, 10, 20 minutes on some of these issues and then I would very much welcome uh, discussion and, and questions from you. And so um, Emily said that it'd be great to talk about safety and security. So this is a brand new presentation. Um, and so we'll see how it goes today. Um, but I thought um, I would start here. So let me share my screen and see if that works. Um, and do this. Uh, can you see that? Great. Okay. So, um, biosafety and biosecurity. So then there are two main takeaways today. The first is that we are never fully safe or secure. And the second is that we can be safer and more secure by design. And one of the reasons I've worked in biosafety and biosecurity is I think that safety and security is such a compelling challenge when you're thinking about safeguarding and securing uh, from the very stuff that we are made of, right? So even just the question of what makes for a more safe and more secure world um, is a extremely challenging question when it comes to manipulating the stuff the living world is made out of. And you know, this hasn't escaped many people. Uh, this is uh, from several years ago now in December, uh, November, December 2013, a foreign affairs article. Um, and you know, it, it poses the same challenge we see again and again in uh, magazines, in stories about this field. Um, and it's really be happy and worry, right? Biology is both going to save the world and it's going to make it more vulnerable. And so it's this landscape. In, it's the question of, is that the right story? And possibly there's an interesting middle ground in between. And certainly we're waking up to that moment right now as we're facing a very small bit of biology that has caused chaos in the world. And, um, and also while we're relying on the tools of biotechnology and the products around um, the therapies as well as the, the types of, of vaccines, um, to get us out of this mess. Um, but it's not that alone. It's also the policies and the social structures behind them. One of the other design challenges behind it that keeps me um, really excited to work in this field is how, how do you ensure in a world in which all of these other living organisms are engineering other organisms that um, we are indeed uh, not just safe and secure, but um, living the best lives that we can. Um, how do we make sure that we have an environment um, that we want to work in? How do we make sure that the environment is, help, is, uh, is sustainably managed? How do we make sure that we are um, also um, uh, ensuring that all of the other values we care about in a world in which we want to live <laughs> um, are upheld? Ultimately, you know, as we engineer the living world, how do we make sure we are engineering um, a world that is safe, secure, and more just? So 
So I thought it would be useful to go back to the basics when it comes to safety um, and security. So uh, obviously the, the fields of safety and security and our conceptions of it go way beyond biology, right? They um, relate to things we do in our lives every day um, or perhaps things that we don't do so much anymore because we're worried about them not being safe activities. <laughs> so. You know, we, we often see in the headlines and, and, you know, an airplane crash and there's a lot of reaction and worry about airplane safety. Um, but at the same time, we get in our cars all the time. Um, and despite the fact that it is really about, you know, 19, 20 times risker, riskier to get there by car instead of getting there by plane. Um, of course, the very earliest uh, airplanes were much, less safe than the ones we have now, right? <laughs> um, and so there is some science and engineering that went into that process. And so it's, you know, the same thing with our cars. Uh, but then, you know, this is never a static process. Now we've got a whole new type of risk um, in our lives around, you know, yet another biological agent. And I wonder what you are thinking about um, when it comes to, is it safer to be going somewhere in your car? Should you get in a plane? What are the trade-offs? Should you leave your apartment? <laughs> so that risk calculus that we do, uh, we do it every day and everything, but we're not in a risk-free world, right? We know that we make um, hopefully calculated risks, but not always calculated risks every day. Um, this is a, a one depiction of then how to think about um, biological safety and security. Um, so this is version one of, of this image. So I welcome critique. <laughs> um, but you might imagine yourselves, right, as, as Biome or iGEM or, you know, future um, uh, or current um, uh, you know, researchers in the lab um, or, you know, in new lab spaces um, that you're, you know, this person on the, on the left-hand side um, who, uh, you know, is, is thinking about developing, thinking about coronavirus, thinking about, I want to, you know, make a, a vaccine or a therapeutic or a diagnostic, right? And so safety is really here on, on the left side and for, in making sure that as we do the research that we're doing, that we're protecting ourselves, um, our friends, uh, our environments from accidentally becoming harmed by the things that we are trying to uh, to research and, and understand and engineer, right? And so often it's actually a pretty uh, simple idea, even if the way to make sure that you're safe in that environment and make sure you are uh, not exposing others to those agents is often pretty complex, right? So maybe for instance, she, she should be, you know, buttoning up her lab coat and, and maybe uh, wearing some gloves. Maybe if she's working with SARS coronavirus, right? Uh, maybe there should be, uh, you know, goggles to protect. Uh, but also there's a question of we're learning right now about how these types of agents are transmitted, right? And what exactly is the risk? And so there's a question of, do you, do you try to be a little bit safer? Uh, do you be on the safe side? How do you make those um, decisions over time? Um, when you come to security, it's a little bit of a more complex challenge. So in security um, over here on the right, uh, you might imagine there are some other people in the world um, who might have some different intentions. And it is really hard to figure out, you know, we can make some guesses on what the intention of this person on the right is, uh, maybe some like informed guesses, um, but you know, they might have different imaginations of what you can do with a dangerous biological agent. Um, and so, you know, that sometimes is a stretch for many people to think about um, the security thing of not protecting yourself, but protecting others who might want to do harm um, from the types of agents that can cause harm. Um, the interesting thing for me is thinking about the mechanisms that you would use to try and prevent those types of incidents, right? Are you going to, and, and also how they can occur. So how does the, you know, the evil mad scientist robot on the, <laughs> on the side, get to know about dangerous biological agents and their uses, right? Are they reading about it in the latest, uh, the latest thriller? Uh, are they reading about it in science? Um, uh, do they get to that knowledge and skills through reading the latest scientific literature? Are they actually in 
uh, able to go and get the the agents themselves, right? Can they go and and uh, and do they have access to the lab? Do they have access to uh, dangerous agents in their environment that they can repurpose in different ways? Um, are they just downloading the information, right? Do they have the tools at home in order to acquire those agents? And so there's a lot of uncertainty over, you know, what are the mechanisms that might inspire or enable individuals that might want to cause harm? Um, and then the question is, what do you do about it? So, you know, you, you have a few different tools, kind of like you have different tools over in the safety realm. You might try to disincentivize or, you know, stop the mechanisms of informa information. You might deter someone from doing that misuse. You might also think about actually limiting access, right? Limiting access to, say, a, a, a physical agent is a little bit easier than thinking about limiting access to the information. Um, you might also think about making the researcher more aware of the potential that somebody might cause harm. Um, but you can see that none of these things are related, right? It's not zero sum. You, how do you accumulate knowledge and information about biological things that are already killing us all the time <laughs> while not posing these types of, of risks um, that unnecessarily, right? How do we be more calculated? How do we design both the technologies and the policies that, that help us be more secure? Um, so I'm going to just introduce first here some potential uh, ways to think about risk that are Im embedded in our current policies and structures. So, so I'm gonna sort of skip ahead to the things that you might have encountered if you did like safety and security training in the lab, right? So um, you might have seen biosafety levels um, on, on lab doors, right? And, and also you might have encountered risk groups already in your, um, in your safety form. So the iGEM team, I just got saw they got asked to submit a safety form um, <laughs> saying, you know, what is the safety or what is the risk in your lab? And so there are some, you know, general principles and rules that have been developed around standards. And so here is one example, and these are risk groups, which are not the same as the biosafety levels, but often there's some mapping between them. And roughly, you know, you can read some of this, but it basically is the higher the risk group, the more likely that the particular agent is going to cause a disease and we don't have the mechanisms to treat or prevent it, right? So it's that combination of both the hazard and the mechanisms <laughs> to mitigate, right, uh, those particular hazards over time. Um, so we, we might ex examine some examples here, right? So up at the top are things like smallpox, <laughs> um, but, you know, somewhere in the middle is, is something like uh, SARS or SARS-CoV-2, um, is being treated at this risk group two. Why is it a risk group three at that level? Um, it, you know, it's this calculation of do we have some preventative measures or not? Um, and then, um, and then what is the relative risk? Um, and then down below are levels around uh, like salmonella um, and things like E. coli and yeast. There are also these types of environments that we've designed, these are the biosafety levels, that are also that protection against the particular types of agents. So it's not just the agent, it's like, is it going to be aerosolized? Is it going to come in through your skin, right? Is it, is it bloodborne? Um, and those types of things correspond to the controls in the lab. Um, and there's laboratory controls that, again, are like keeping the bugs away from you, keeping bugs in the lab. <laughs> There's another set of, of, um, of agents and they really relate to security. In the US, these are often referred to a select agent list that the um, Center for Disease Control um, has. And, and this is a combination of things, which includes both things we know are dangerous and we can be misused, but also you can ask, how do we know that those things can get misused? Often it's from examples in the past. So, we do have examples of both um, individuals, groups, as well as states, countries that have tried to use biology as a weapon. And, and so there are certain attributes that make things more likely to be able to cause different types of harm depending on the motivations. And so we use these examples to try and choose a subset of things that we pay extra attention to and have certain types of controls around them. The other thing to pay attention to in security is the biggest 
the, you know, the biggest safeguard against um, the misuse of biology is international agreement that we don't weaponize biology. <laughs> um, so the, the, there is, there is a, the Biological Weapons Convention, also known as the Biological Toxins and Weapons Convention, which the majority of countries in the world have signed on to, though not all of them, um, that say that we will not, you know, biology is not permissible um, to be developed um, as a weapon. And, um, and so that's a, a, it's that collective agreement that we're not even gonna go there is part of um, a, what we all are entrusted um, with in ensuring over time. The, the next thing here I just wanted to highlight is the idea that, you know, I mentioned all these standards and controls that exist, the different risk levels, but what I hope you take from today is that these are made by people, <laughs> right? Ultimately, you know, these risk groups came from somewhere and it's I, I would, I think it's actually quite interesting to look into where they came from. So this is um, a, a Silomar. If any of you have not heard of a Silomar, I, I'd suggest you read this piece from um, uh, Rolling Stone in, in 1975 that describes a, a meeting of 140 scientists just down the coast in California um, to come up with some of the principles by which we can uh, take forward the science and engineering of, of biology um, while, while, safe, while safeguarding against risk. There's lots of legitimate critiques of this mechanism, but it did have a role in helping to set up those systems of safety and security. And so here's just a little snippet um, from this. Um, and it, I, I think it sets the, the contextualization. These are some of the scientists at this time who were trying to figure out what the controls uh, or what their, what, what their advice was on developing different um, types of, of risk levels and controls. And they said, you know, here's an alternate, an alternative suggestion had been to create three less specific risk categories. They've been considering six risk categories, um, high, moderate, and low, right? <laughs> Just because it makes sense. Um, but why shouldn't someone ask? We benefit from all the experience we already have. And Watson, you might know which Watson it is, slumped low in the middle of his, the audience mutters to his neighbor, but there is no experience, right? And I think this is this tension of, we have experience in other domains, but every time we have new technologies, we have to ask what of the systems that we have already used should we adopt and what do we have to create anew? And we're still going through this process of creating things anew. We um, have these forums for debate that look somewhat similar to what we did before. This is an update 40 years later uh, for the National Academies. This is actually around the Human Genome um, Editing Summit. And they're asking some of the same questions, right? How do we know this is safe? How do we make sure this is secure? And we have to come up with new guidelines uh, over time. So we both have to respect the past and build upon it, um, but also update to new events. Which gets me uh, to the, you know, the final design challenge I said at the beginning, how do we deal with this world <laughs> in which we are enabling thousands of, of young people all over the world um, to use the tools of engineering life, right? How do you build safety and security into that type of system? Um, so luckily, um, also, there is a history to this, right? So we didn't start off with that challenge of thousands of students across dozens of countries. We started off with a few teams of students who were <laughs> working on synthetic biology projects in a few spaces. And, um, and then there was some, you know, important design decision made at the beginning. One of them was to bake in this value that we have a shared responsibility um, to if this is such a powerful technology that has so many beneficial uses, we need to make sure that we safeguard against its misuses. Um, and also this goes beyond just safety and security to think about those other types of ethical uh, principles like justice, right? How do we ensure that the technologies we develop enable more just societies? Um, and this is embedded in some of the mantra within iGEM specifically of, you know, you need to consider how your work affects the world and the world affects your work. Um, so it's this two-way dialogue. Um, in practice, what we've done, and I've been part of this for many years, um, is set up essentially a, a two-part system, which is um, a sort of set of positive incentives and guidance 
um, to recognize the innovation required across not just safety and security, but beyond, as well as safety and security specifically, making sure that we're building upon the past and, and examples therein. And so the designs around safety and security have spanned everything from uh, designing policies around what research you can do, to developing guidance around things like um, uh, common mistakes in the lab. You'll see another incidence here of uh, perhaps not wearing gloves where you should, <laughs> um, to the incentives and rewards, um, to actually doing things at the technology side. How do you automatically screen the types of biological parts you might use to quickly flag and detect the ones that are concerning, right? Building on that knowledge. And how do you review the projects? How do you look at the intention of a project and decide that maybe this is going somewhere where the applications uh, are leading to something dangerous, either from a safety or security standpoint? And then ultimately, this is a, a collective human process. You have to have advisors. So we have advisors across a wide number of, of countries and organizations um, that advise and, and they use iGEM as a test bed to figure out how to keep a pace of the forefront of, um, of science and engineering. Um, and then as iGEM students, you might, you might know this, um, and it's actually embedded in the incentive structure. So in, in iGEM, uh, you only get to come if you at least comply by the base set of rules. Uh, but that's not enough, right? You actually have to innovate. So we leave it to the teams um, to also know the particular set of issues that will come up with their, their designs. Because they're you know, working at the forefront of science and engineering. They're going to come up with something that we maybe never thought of. Um, and the idea is you don't do it alone, right? You work with stakeholders, your safety offices. You might work with... Um, you might work with the FBI, uh, you might work with companies to figure out how to safeguard the world um, to make sure that your uh, technologies can interface with our systems in ways that make us collectively more secure and more safe. Um, and of course, we give prizes <laughs> um, to the best teams. Um, and so we reward excellence in going beyond compliance. Um, and then we've seen some really amazing things coming up with new um, technologies, new policies, new communities. Um, and these are just some of the examples here. Um, and I'm happy to go in more. We've also had some of our students actually go uh, to the United Nations to talk about how they do it in teaching the experts um, how to do it really on the ground. Um, and this is just one example and where it really, um, I, I hope serves as an inspiring one. This is you know, um, the, arguably one of the first iGEM teams uh, at, at MIT or the first iGEM team. Um, and, and now they have a company, right, that actually makes organisms by design. Um, but they've baked in safety and security as part of uh, their portfolio. So Ginkgo um, works on advising some of the uh, government officials and other experts on how to think about uh, safety and security in a biological age. Um, but they also develop technologies that are helping protect us um, and helping us respond to some of the biological threats that occur outside um, often of, of our immediate control in things like this um, particular portfolio doing uh, testing um, and, and, and tracing and beyond. So just to come back, you know, this is really, uh, the message here is, you know, we're never fully safe or secure. And so uh, keeping that in mind, but we have choices and we can use our engineering um, uh, mindset, our science, uh, in order to design both policies and technologies that make us safer and secure um, by design. And just to end off, I think this is one of the most compelling uh, challenge areas and really safety and security engineering really is at the cutting edge. Um, so I think it's a fascinating area to go into. Thank you. Yeah. So awesome. I'm most curious about your questions. <laughs> of course. Um, I guess I guess the first one that I wanted to ask, or speaking a little bit more to the accessibility of this information and these technologies, I was wondering if you could discuss perhaps um, in a a little more detail kind of the pros and cons of um, accessibility to like per potentially dangerous genetic sequences or reagents? Yeah, it, you know, it's um, even before you go to pros and pros and cons, I think it's thinking about um, 
you know, what does access mean? Um, and it, it often has to do with really foundational concepts about how do we learn? How do we acquire skills? How are we able to actually use the knowledge that we generate? Um, and so, you know, it's not just about, uh, it, many scientists know, it's not just about a, a paper being up, it's actually being able to use, you know, on the internet, it's actually, can you use that paper to do something useful in your lab, right, or in the world? And there's often quite a disconnect there. Um, so we talk about, you know, what are the types of knowledge that can be codified, right, that can be easily transmitted, and what are the types of things that are often tacit, right? So you actually need to be, you know, um, besides someone, you need to, you know, learn it, you can't actually codify it and communicate it. And so when I think about, um, I think about access, I think about not only that, but also how do we shape what people want to do with that knowledge, right? So it's, it's also about the motivations, the intentions. Um, uh, that was my cat running by <laughs> often uh, in, in these seminars these days. Um, and so, you know, I think about in many cases, we have this mantra of like knowledge is good, right? All knowledge is good. And what the, that's what a lot of these debates are about is like, is all knowledge good? Or is all information sharing good? And so these are really foundational concepts. So I think it's not so much, is it good or bad, but actually what do you mean by access? Or what do we mean by openness and transparency? So in general, my feelings are, we wanna be as open as we can be. <laughs> um, and that we um, can be open, we can be transparent, we can have access if we're learning at the same time. Um, so a lot of my, uh, my work focuses on, okay, if we are um, giving access to all these tools of, of biology, all this knowledge over places, how can we create the mechanisms, the social structures so people can then share what they've done, right? And then other people can learn. And that when we have a, um, a community that can see, that can learn over time, we're accountable to many more people. And so we're much more likely to be proceeding in a, in a place where many people can benefit from the technology. Um, so that's a little bit nuanced, but I don't believe in just openness. I believe in openness with sharing. <laughs> I guess a, a little more specifically then, you have sort of websites and platforms and databases for DNA sequences. Um, and I was wondering if we could get like your thoughts or concerns about um, platforms like that, that allow access to just sequences that people around the world can publish. Yeah, um, I, I think it's similar to uh, the response I, um, I had before. I think that we, um, in many cases, um, we want to be able to enable as many people as possible to use these foundational tools, um, right? And then we need to be mindful of the fact, though, that they will be misused. So it's not a free-for-all, um, but it is how do we actually build systems so that we can learn from the failures, um, so what's happening right now is with a lot of the um, providers of, of um, you know, you want your sequence. <laughs> so um, they, um, which happens now for a variety of different mechanisms, right? You might go directly to the provider, you might do it in house, you might go through an intermediate organization that's gonna do the, the experiments for you. <laughs> but it's generally if the request is, I want this DNA. <laughs> Then um, we, then the companies that are controlling that or the different organizations, they'll be worried about what's the specific sequence, but also who are you and what do you want to do with it? <laughs> um, and in many cases now they have to show a standard of being able to detect a set of things that are concerning. So there's actually like a test for companies. They have to show that they meet some standard of being able to screen customers and orders. But it's difficult to, for them to share across the different groups what exactly they do. It's considered proprietary. Um, and so there's a question of like, how can you enable a system that allows you to learn um, from those incidents over time and share best practices without 
compromising, you know, the intellectual property of, of those companies or not compromising it too much. <laughs> um, so that's, um, that's really like a current struggle right now. It's that it's become as the price um, of synthesis has dropped, um, it's become more costly relative to the price um, to do these types of screens. And so how do you do it more efficiently? Kind of speaking of um, designing systems that we can learn from our failures, uh, in the wake of this whole pandemic, we've seen that like a lot of our uh, structural response to, um, you know, global biosecurity issues has a lot of room for improvement. Do you have any like thoughts or insight on uh, how we could better design a system to handle pandemics or like other biological threats? How many hours do we have? How many days do we have here? <laughs> there are so many, so many thoughts. Um, I think that um, I think there's a few a few things here to mention. One is that um, we're seeing a lot of experiments play out in the world in real time in terms of the types of response to pandemics, and uh, we're seeing that um, in many cases these come down to issue issues of of um, of governance and leadership, right? Um, so even if we have the tools. Um, or even if we have the capacity to develop tools, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be, um, to, they're not necessarily gonna be used. And so a lot of it is around um, ultimately responding to any sort of disaster, biological or not, relies on leadership that is able to keep a pace um, of a rapidly evolving threat, right? Um, and, and so that, that has shown up in many different places. Um, but also, um, there are many things that if we know, and we do know, that there are going to be more biological threats, um, that we can plan for those, um, both through developing technologies that are um, platform uh, technologies to respond and um, to any types of, of threat. And it's always a, a calculus, right? How much, how much do you spend um, now, um, uh, depending on how big of a, a threat you imagine? And I think before, people didn't really understand the scale of the threat. And so that calculus and that imagination is gonna change. Um, a lot of what I spend my time on is, um, I have a lot of great colleagues who work a lot on response um, to threats. I work on a lot of things that are sort of left of boom, which is how do we prevent, <laughs> how do we prevent threats? Um, and so a lot of the safety and security elements um, that I've been talking about in, in the context of, um, uh, of of the laboratory setting really um, are you know, saying, if we know there's these other threats, how do we make sure we don't contribute to it? Um, but what's occurring now, as you might've seen, there's some, there've been debates around origins of, of the pandemic, right? Um, overwhelmingly, it, it seems to be natural origin, but there's continued speculation and concern and there's investigations around it. And it, it relates to um, this question of, is a threat more likely to originate outside a lab, inside a lab, or mediated through other research activities, right? If you're going out and doing field work and other things. And so it's this complex problem of, well, to mitigate future threats, should you be going out into the field to collecting, you know, collect a lot more agents and see what's going on? <laughs> or, or is that actually the thing that's causing you more risk? Um, so that's why um, it's both doing, you know, we need to develop forensic and detection tools at the same time as we're developing the technologies and that those forensic and detection tools, the knowledge that we gain, the ability to understand how we're interacting with the living world, those are the things that safeguard us against all types of threats. Um, and so I think my hope is that we actually make sure we prioritize applied safety and security research at the same time. Um, as we're working on all of these other things, because it's going to be a protection in the end. Yeah, yeah, very important, especially right now. Um, I guess one one question that I have that's a, a little bit of switching gears. Um, it's kind of to think about the intersection of biosecurity and um, 
de-extinction, both of like single cell organisms and multicellular organisms. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your work on like revive and restore and uh, some things around that. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I am on the uh, board of an organization called Revive and Restore, um, and they're focused on um, uh, biotechnologies and conservation. Um, and um, it's interesting because um, they're, you know, this, this comes back way to how do we think about security, right? How do we think about, is it just human security? Is, or is it security of the broader living world, right? Is, is ensuring biodiversity part of security? Others like Rob Carlson say, you know, we need to think about natural security, right? <laughs> um, uh, not, not just national security. <laughs> um, is it, um, and other brands is like economic security and others. And so there's many different values that are often filtered through the lens of security. Um, in the in the conservation world, um, one of the things that we try to learn about is, well, if we're worried about humans going extinct or being harmed, what can we also learn from other organisms <laughs> going extinct or being harmed? And so um, many of the types of, of um, uh, extinctions that we might imagine or, or endangered species also have a facet of disease, right? They become uh, more susceptible to disease, um, and so many of the technologies that might be imagined to, re to help alleviate um, that disease, whether it's a, a, a blight, um, a fungal blight on a, a chestnut um, or um, a plague in ferrets, <laughs> um, you might try to engineer in disease resistance in order to help save that particular species. Um, and this is where a lot of the you know, interesting security dimensions come in, um, which is, you know, it, does that pose an additional risk? Um, and, but it's often really about these levels of scales. So, you know, is the bigger risk around one species, one population, um, one environment? And so um, I'd say that, you know, there's no real solution here other than to say conservation and security communities are often kind of divorced um, in some ways, but they actually are often dealing with many shared um, challenges. Uh, and, and so there's a, a rich array of questions there. I know Catherine here, who's on the line, um, has been with our group uh, looking at some of these, um, these questions as well. Thank you. Um, switching gears back again, sort of to the pandemic. Um, I was wondering, um, sort of about your thoughts on contact tracing and how useful it is, but also how it intersects with um, privacy issues and kind of concerns around that. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Say that again? Uh, essentially, we were, I was wondering, um, what are your thoughts on using contact tracing to combat the COVID-19 pandemic mm. because of issues with, um, you know, public safety, but also privacy and, uh, private information. Yeah, I think um, I haven't worked a lot on, on contract tracing, um, but I've been part of some discussions uh, are, uh, from other groups who are more expert than, than me. Um, but, you know, it, I think it's a good example of the complexities of any sort of um, mechanism, like, you know, frankly, like public policy mechanism or, or intervention um, around what is ultimately shared challenges around safety and security, right? So where are we um, having trade-offs in, you know, individual um, uh, individual rights and individual liberties um, with, you know, collective security? And um, we we look at this in public health, you know, all all the time, um, as well as in other areas. And so. Um, I think what you're in part alluding to is, you know, there are technologies and approaches that allow us to get closer to achieving that balance, right? How do we protect, you know, individuals while also protecting broader publics? Um, but ultimately, there is a trade-off that happens, right? We give up some of our 
individual <laughs> liberties to be able to, you know, protect our collective interests. And so that's those are the types of challenges that I really find interesting um, because they they at the end of the day we we never achieve I think perfect ideals either through the technologies or the policies. We're always making trade offs. And ultimately, those come down to how people collectively decide how to govern themselves, right? Um, and so often things that we think are like technology problems, like how do you de develop the per perfect app to protect somebody's, you know, privacy, they're often really governance challenges, they're, you know, and, um, and so you can never really get away from them. <laughs> yeah, certainly, certainly a really fascinating field of topic. Um, I guess one last broad question that I think is important, but as I said, broad, um, what do you think are kind of the most pertinent biosecurity issues that we're facing and what are some steps that we should start thinking about or taking to help mitigate risk basically? There are, um, it's, you know, it's such a, a, a broad challenge, but I think a, a, a good one at the end of the day, right? Like what, what should we be paying attention to? Um, and I think at risk of being a th little, you know, ethereal, <laughs> I think we need to rethink what we mean by safety and security often, um, right? So um, the idea that, um, is something being talked about under a lens of security um, for different political purposes or different strategic purposes, right? Um, and so that it's it's kind of you know it's it's a different it's not a direct question like here are our security threats, right? That that's one of them. Like we need to think about broadly what does a world look like what does a secure world look like when we are really good at engineering biology, right? But that, that really does cause you to question like, what does security mean? Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge. I think it's also the one we often neglect because um, we're like, okay, security means keeping bad, you know, bugs from bad people. <laughs> um, but uh, that only gets you so far and it, it forces you to say, oh, there's bad people, right? Um, when it's often a lot more complex, right? It's like, how did different interests come together? Um, so I think those are the, the two things, like we need to rethink what we actually mean by security often. We need to think about how that manifests in a world in which we're really good at engineering life, right? What is our security strategy? Um, and then the third one is we have to actually like develop the people that we want to work on those things <laughs> and recognize the shared challenge. So it's not, it's, uh, and at, at the end of the day, make sure the biology is never thought about as a good weapon. <laughs> um, if we can keep um, a course for biology as something that is um, used to develop more, you know, peaceful, prosperous, and just societies, I think um, that we will all be living in a world in which we <laughs> love the engineering of biology. All right. Um, thank you so much for talking with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Of course. Now, stop the recording.